and you knew what he was going to do, but you couldn't stop him from doing it. He's textbook. Absolutely textbook. Yes, he is a Hall of Famer, and to this day is high up on the all-time scoring and rebounding leaderboards. But as a whole, the 70s are one of, if not the most overlooked decade of professional basketball, and few players dominated that decade like Elvin Hayes. Obviously the generations that got to see him play knew how special he was, but as time goes on, the players not named Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or Julius Irving seem to fall through the cracks when talking about the 70s, but only one player scored more points than Hayes during that decade, and that was Kareem. Hayes was known for his signature turnaround jumper, which he perfected, and with the way he extended his arms when he shot, it was nearly unblockable. But at a slender 6'9", he was often playing undersized, yet was one of the most tenacious rebounders of all time, and never gave up on a putback, even if it took him 3 or 4 attempts. And even though his offense was his calling card, that wasn't all he did, as he also left the game as one of its best shot blockers. And if you were ever unsure if the Big E had the ball or not, you just had to listen for the crowd's chant of <laughs> to know that Hayes had it. He was a trailblazing star at the University of Houston, leading them to a defeat of UCLA in the game of the century. And while his talent was undeniable upon his NBA arrival, he was constantly criticized for his attitude and hard-headedness. So when he became a bullet in his prime, fans held their breath, but he fully bought in and played a huge role in the most successful period of Washington basketball before gracefully ending his career with Houston. So while Hayes is certainly not forgotten, as time goes on, he gets overlooked for how consistent and productive he was, with a game that defied age. Let's jog your memory. A Louisiana native, Elvin Hayes was taught at a young age to value his self-respect and dignity, and to never let anyone walk all over him, which was a mindset he'd take with him throughout his career and life. But the career that would make him so successful almost never happened, as he didn't pick up a basketball until 8th grade. After being wrongfully sent to the office for a prank, he would be noticed by another teacher, who would put Hayes on the school team. But the game didn't exactly come naturally to Hayes. By 9th grade, he was 6'5 and on the junior varsity team. Yet he was warming the bench, however, he wanted to crack the starting lineup, and would focus on developing the turnaround shot that would become his calling card throughout his time in the NBA. Fast forward to his 1964 senior season at Britain High School, and Hayes was averaging 35 points a game and would lead Britain to a state title, finishing with 45 points and 20 rebounds in the championship game. Hayes realized he had a legitimate future in the sport, and saw basketball as a way to escape poverty. So when he was offered a scholarship from the University of Houston, he didn't think twice, and it seemed like a good fit for him, as Hayes would speak very highly of the coaching staff at Houston, a coaching staff which was led by Hall of Fame coach Guy Lewis. It was also here where he would earn his Big E nickname, reportedly due to him being a rallying point just like the Navy's aircraft carrier Enterprise. Hayes' varsity college career began as a sophomore in the 1966 season, due to the NCAA rule prohibiting freshmen from playing varsity. So Hayes, along with another great sophomore in Don Chaney, would join the team, as the two became the first African-American players in school history. Chaney would be solid this year, but Hayes immediately became one of the nation's top players, finishing as a top 10 scorer and top 5 rebounder in the country. Houston would start the season 0-3, but would recover to finish the regular season at 21-5 and, and receive a bid for the NCAA tournament, where in the first round, they would defeat Colorado State, with Hayes putting up 18-12 and 12 before fouling out. But the following game versus Oregon State in the regional semifinal would end in defeat, as Hayes had just 14-10. and 10. Then Houston would wrap up their season with a win over Pacific in the regional third place game, as Hayes dominated with 31 points and 28 rebounds. But Houston's season was over, and Hayes had averaged about 27 points and 17 rebounds per game. The 1967 season was the first true year of the Elvin Hayes and Don Chaney duo. Hayes had upped his scoring from last year and was now a top 5 scorer in the country, while also being a top 10 rebounder, as Hayes was named a consensus first team All-American. Houston began the year ranked 7th in the nation, and after a loss to Michigan in the third game of the season, they won 12 straight and ranked as high as 3rd. Then after going 2-2 two two over their next 4, they would win their final seven to finish the season with a 23-3 record while earning another tournament berth. A narrow first round defeat of New Mexico State would see Hayes lead all players with 30 points and 14 rebounds. Then Houston would have a statement win over number three Kansas in the regional semis as Hayes finished with 19 points and 10 rebounds. 
they kept rolling with a double-digit defeat of SMU in the Elite Eight, as Hayes led all scorers with 31 points and added 11 rebounds. So Houston was headed to the first Final Four in school history, but waiting for them was an undefeated UCLA team led by Lou Alcindor. And although Hayes finished with a game-high 25 points and 24 rebounds, Alcindor made him earn every one of his points, as Hayes would only shoot 12 of 31 from the field, and the Cougars as a whole would shoot less than 35% for the game, ultimately losing by 15. But the following night, Hayes would put up 23 and 16, as Houston easily defeated North Carolina in the national third place game. With Hayes' junior season ending, with him averaging about 28.5 points, 15.5 rebounds, and one assist per game. But 1968 would see Houston and Hayes turn in one of the most historic moments in college basketball. The 68 season would be the best version of Hayes, as he would record career highs in both scoring and rebounding, while finishing top three in the country in both categories, en route to once again being named a consensus first team All-American. With Hayes scoring nearly 37 points per game, Houston would boast the nation's highest scoring offense, and began the season as the number two ranked team in the nation, and they were running through everyone, but they weren't going to capture that number one ranking, as a UCLA team who hadn't lost a game since near the end of the 1966 season occupied that top ranking. But on January 20th, 1968, Houston got their chance to become the nation's number one team, when the Bruins came to town to play the Cougars in a contest dubbed the Game of the Century as it was college basketball's first nationally televised regular season game and featured a record-breaking crowd of 52,693 people packed into Houston's Astrodome. So a 17-0 Cougars team were taking on a 13-0 Bruins team, who overall were on a 47-game win streak. But this was anyone's best chance to beat UCLA, as Alcindor had suffered a scratch cornea about a week earlier and had spent a lot of time in the hospital leading up to this game. But Alcindor injury or not, Hayes' first half performance cannot be discredited. Over the first 20 minutes, Hayes would take 19 shots and convert on 14 of them, as he scored 29 first half points, which accounted for over half of Houston's points, with the Cougars holding an unexpected 3 point lead at halftime. UCLA was determined to have someone else beat them in the second half, as Hayes would only take 6 more shots in the game, but he also had to be careful, as he played the final 12 minutes of the game with 4 fouls. But UCLA came back, and with less than 30 seconds left, the score was tied at 69, when Hayes got himself a trip to the free throw line. And even though Hayes shot below 62% from the line this season, he would explain that he wasn't worried at all. He wanted the game in his hands. And he would drain both. Then after a mental error led to a UCLA turnover, Houston would run out the clock to complete one of the biggest upsets in basketball history. With Hayes finishing his night with 39 points on 17 of 25 shooting, along with 15 rebounds and 8 blocks with three of those rejections coming on Alcindor shots. But Houston had gotten the win to remain undefeated and secure the nation's top ranking. And by the end of the regular season, they were still top ranked and undefeated. And Hayes was named College Player of the Year by Sporting News. The NCAA tournament began with an easy defeat of Loyola, as Hayes finished with 49 points and 27 rebounds. The regional semis were another easy win, this time over a Louisville team led by Wes Unseld but Hayes got the better of him with 34 points and 21 rebounds on over 51% shooting. Houston kept cruising in the Elite Eight as Hayes finished with 39 points and 25 rebounds in an easy defeat of TCU. But for the second year, the Cougars would meet the Bruins in the Final Four. And now UCLA was hungry for revenge, and Alcindor was healthy. And even though Hayes had been on a tear all tournament, he was neutralized in this game. Hayes would take 10 shots and only make three of them, finishing with just 10 points and only pulling down 5 rebounds, while finding himself in foul trouble. And without Hayes putting up his usual big numbers, the Cougars stood no chance, losing by 32 points. Then even though Hayes came back with 34 points and 16 rebounds in the national third place game, Houston still lost a close one to Ohio State, as Hayes' senior season had seen him average about 37 points, 19 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. But now Hayes' college career was over, and he was without a doubt the best prospect entering the draft. But this was 1968, and it was still a war of two leagues, between the NBA and ABA, and Hayes would need to make a decision. Hayes would be drafted first overall by the NBA's San Diego Rockets, but he was also the first pick of the ABA's Houston Mavericks. However, Hayes would ultimately choose to sign a four-year deal with San Diego, worth a total of $440,000. And while the NBA was a more established league, this was still surprising, as Hayes had starred at the University of Houston over the past few years 
and the Mavericks owner had offered Hayes a two-year deal worth 500000 Yet Hayes refused to even negotiate with the ABA team, leading to their owner accusing the Rockets of paying Hayes under the table while he was still in college. But Hayes had put pen to paper and was the NBA's brightest young star going into the 1969 season. The Rockets were in just their second year of existence and coming off a 15-67 and 67 season, and were one of the league's lowest scoring teams in 1968. The Rockets' top player was forward Don Kojis, but Hayes would quickly take over that title. Additionally, the Rockets featured a second-year wing who became better known for his coaching, named Pat Riley. But Hayes showed that he was worth the ticket price from day one, as he went for 25-12 and 12 in his first career game, then followed that up with 32-24, and 24, as the Rockets began the season 2-0. and 0. Over the rest of the year, he continued his scoring barrage, hitting double figures in 82 games, including 7 games with at least 40, and his career high of 54 points, to go along with 22 rebounds in a November 13th defeat of Detroit, as this would be one of his 78 double-doubles on the season. And he would even accomplish the rare feat of leading the league in scoring as a rookie. But Hayes had plenty of opportunity to put up numbers, as he would set a rookie record for total minutes played and would average over 45 minutes per game. And to no one's surprise, he was named an All-Star, as he would start in the game and score 11 points. But he wouldn't capture the Rookie of the Year award, as he would finish second to the Bullets' Wes Unseld. The addition of Hayes helped the Rockets become the third highest scoring team in the league, and also helped them win 22 more games, with their 37-45 finish being enough to get them their first playoff appearance in franchise history. The division semifinals would bring the Atlanta Hawks, and Hayes played a great series leading the Rockets in rebounding and leading both teams in scoring, while shooting nearly 53% from the field, as he would have two 30-point games and four double-doubles. But after the team split the first four, Atlanta would win the next two to close out the series, as Hayes' rookie year ended with him averaging about 28.5 points, 17 rebounds, and 1.5 assists per game. But while the 1970 season would be much of the same production-wise for Hayes, he would begin to develop a reputation for his attitude, Hayes was again the team's top scorer and a top 3 scorer in the league, and this year he would lead the league in rebounding, as the first player to do so, not named Bill Russell or Wilt Chamberlain, in over a decade. He would again hit double figures in all 82 games, including 7 with at least 40 points, while also recording 79 double-doubles, which included 25 games with at least 20 boards, as he was again named an All-Star and had his best All-Star performance, with 24 points and 15 rebounds. But Hayes and Rockets head coach Jack McMahon hadn't been on the same page during his rookie season, as McMahon would play Hayes at power forward at times, while Hayes wanted to play center against the league's best competition, even if he was undersized. But he didn't have the same drive in practice, as Hayes rarely put in full effort, and on the court, he rarely passed the ball, which frustrated McMahon. Then in a loss to Detroit this season, which dropped the Rockets record to 9-17, Hayes was making a lot of mistakes. And when an angry McMahon confronted him, Hayes told McMahon that he wouldn't be coaching the team for long. And Hayes was right, as McMahon was given the boot the following day, and replaced with legendary coach Alex Hannum. But Hayes didn't change his ways in practice, no matter what Hannum tried. So in a last ditch effort, Hannum cleared the gym, except for him and Hayes. And when the players came back, Hayes was a changed man in practice. And the reason for this being, that Hannum kept it real with him. If he didn't change, Hannum was going to beat him up. But while Hayes may have started practicing harder, it didn't lead to much more winning, as the Rockets would go 18-38 the rest of the season, and their 27-55 record was not enough for a playoff berth, as Hayes finished the season with averages of about 27.5 points, 17 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. Kojis was gone come the 71 season, but the Rockets would get a career year from Stu Lance, and it also picked up a great rookie guard in Calvin Murphy. Once again, Hayes was a top 3 scorer and rebounder in the NBA, as for the third straight season, he would play 82 games and hit double figures in every one of them, which included his second career 50-point game in a November 20th defeat of Seattle. He would also record 77 double-doubles, including two games with at least 30 rebounds, as he had a 38-point and 30-rebound game in a December 12th defeat of the Lakers, then on January 19th, he would pull down a career-high 35 rebounds in a loss to New York, as he would again be named an All-Star. San Diego weren't amazing, but they were playing well, as about halfway through the season, they were 23-20. and 20. But over their next 17, they completely fell apart, as they would lose 10 straight, then after getting one win, they would lose another 6 in a row, falling to 24-36. and 36. They would go 16-6 and 6 the rest of the way, but the damage was done, as their 40-42 and 42 record wouldn't be enough for the playoffs. 
but Hayes showed the positive sides of his character this season, as reportedly during their down period, he informed the Rockets owner that he didn't want to be paid until San Diego broke out of their slump. But Hayes overall season had seen him average about 28.5 points, 16.5 rebounds, and 2.5 blocks per game. Even though Hayes spurned the ABA's Houston Mavericks a few years earlier, he would ultimately end up in Houston, as over the offseason, the Rockets were bought by a Houston-based ownership group, meaning the team would be moving to Texas for the 72 season. But the new owners would also bring in their own coach, meaning Hannum was out and Tex Winter was in. And this would be the beginning of the end for Hayes' time with the Rockets. There were high hopes in Houston with Hayes, Lance, and Murphy, as well as the team getting a great second year out of Rudy Tomjanovich, but it never materialized. Overall, Hayes had a great year, but compared to what he was used to, it seemed down. He would appear in all 82 games, but for the first time in his career, he would fail to hit double figures in all of them, as he would only record 80 games scoring at least 10 points, while averaging a career low in shot attempts. And while he would record 69 double-doubles, this would be the first season of his career where he failed to finish in the league's top 5 in either scoring or rebounding, but he would still be an all-star. However, there seemed to be constant conflict between Hayes and Winter. Early in the season, Hayes would refuse to re-enter a game versus Buffalo, and then soon after that, he would skip practice, as overall, Hayes just didn't like the triangle offense that Winter ran, and he wanted to be the one taking the shot every time he touched the ball, although he would average a career-high 3.3 assists this season. And while the triangle offense is effective, it's only effective when everyone buys in. So with an unhappy Hayes in the lineup all season, the Rockets finished with a worse than expected 34-48 record, as they would again miss the playoffs. With Hayes' season seeing him average about 25 points, 14.5 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. But after such a tumultuous return to Houston, the Rockets would be getting Hayes out of there as soon as possible. Houston acquired center Otto Moore from Phoenix over the offseason. So while this all but guaranteed that Hayes would be shifted to power forward, which was likely the position best suited for him, it also meant he was expendable, as he had reportedly been trying to renegotiate his contract. And with there being no direct communication between Hayes and the Rockets' front office, they felt it was better to start fresh. So in one of the most one-sided deals in NBA history, they sent Hayes to the Baltimore Bullets for forward Jack Marin, immediately giving the Bullets one of the league's most formidable frontcourt duos, as Hayes joined all-star center Wes Unsell. And Hayes would later say that he just didn't fit into the triple post game plan that was the staple of the triangle offense. But at this point, Hayes already had a reputation as a difficult player who didn't handle criticism well and could kill team chemistry. With Bullets coach Gene Shu famously saying at the press conference announcing the Hayes acquisition that the Bullets didn't just get Hayes in the deal, they got his psychiatrist too. While the Bullets had the front court talent, there were still concerns about how they would make it work. Unseld and Hayes had both been undersized centers since they entered the league together five years ago, but Hayes would be the one to shift the power forward, and him and Unseld quickly showed that they would be just fine together, as the duo were rebounding machines. And while Hayes would never again score like he did in Houston, he was still who the Bullets went to when they needed a bucket, and his presence led to guys like Phil Chenier and Mike Reardon getting more open looks. And with Unseld down low, and legitimate scoring threats on the wings, Hayes found himself in more one-on-one -on -one and favorable matchups, so it was a home run of a trade for Baltimore. Hayes' 21.2 points per game was a then-career low by far, but he was still their leading scorer, as he would hit double figures in 75 of his 81 games. And his rebounding was still there, as he recorded 68 double-doubles and was a top-10 rebounder in the league, earning him yet another All-Star selection, as well as a second-team All-NBA selection. The Bullets were coming off a 38-44 season, but in their first year with Hayes, they upped that win total to 52 games. And Hayes would make his return to the playoffs, with Baltimore getting a semifinals matchup with New York. Hayes was great in his postseason return, as he led all players in scoring and was second to unselled in rebounding. He would have 16 and 14 in game one, but after this would average 31 points on over 57% shooting in games two through four. Yet the Bullets found themselves down three games to one. Then in Game 5, Hayes had 20 and 9, but shot just 8 of 21 from the field, as the Knicks wrapped up the series. With Hayes' first season as a bullet, seeing him average about 21 points, 14 and a half rebounds, and 1 and a half assists per game. The Baltimore Bullets would now be the Capital Bullets for the 1974 season, but they were still the same team led by the same star duo. But not exactly, as on top of featuring a new head coach in Casey Jones, half of their star duo was rarely at full strength, 
as knee surgery led to unsettled missing 27 games and not being able to perform at his usual standard in the games he did play in. So Hayes had to try and make up for the lost production. For the first time in his career, he would fail to lead his team in scoring, but he made up for it on the glass, as his career-high 18.1 rebounds per game would lead the league. And as blocks would become an officially tracked stat, Hayes made sure to rack those up too, as he averaged 3 per game in his 81 games played, while playing a league-leading 44.5 minutes in those games. He would still hit double figures in 77 games, including 4 with at least 40, and would record 75 double-doubles, with one of his career best performances coming in a November 17th defeat of Atlanta, when he finished with 43 points and 32 rebounds, as he would once again be named an All-Star and a member of the All-NBA second team, while even finishing top 5 in MVP voting. But the top 5 finish was for his defense as much as it was his offense as he would boast the second lowest defensive rating in the league and be named second team all defense. And even with a beat up unselled, the Bullets were still a complete team and would turn in a 47-35 record, which would get them a return to the playoffs and a rematch with New York in the semis. Unselled was back and played well, but it was again Hayes who stepped up his play in the postseason, leading both teams in scoring and rebounding while shooting over 53%. He would have 40-14 and 14 in Game 1, then followed that up with 34-21 and 21 in Game 2, and after a solid Game 3, the Bullets were up 2-1. However, they would lose their next two, but then facing elimination in Game 6, Hayes poured in 31 points and pulled down 23 rebounds to extend the series, but he struggled in Game 7 with just 12 points on 5 of 15 shooting as the Bullets were bounced, but Hayes' season had seen him average about 21.5 points, 18 rebounds, and 3 blocks per game but the 1975 season would see the Bullets officially enter among the league's elite, thanks in no small part to Hayes. They would now be known as the Washington Bullets in 1975 and would stay like that for the rest of Hayes' time there. Unseld was a lot healthier, and Phil Chenier continued as a great backcourt scorer, but Hayes would turn in his best scoring season since leaving Houston, as he led the team and finished as a top 10 scorer in the league. His rebounding dropped, but that was a direct result of Unseld's healthier season and Hayes returning full-time to power forward. He would hit double figures in 77 games, including 23 with at least 30, and would still record 64 double-doubles, which included a 35-point, 20-rebound performance in a February 12th defeat of Milwaukee, as yet again Hayes was named an All-Star, and this season would see him named First Team All-NBA. Defensively, he would be a top-five shot blocker for the second consecutive season, and finish with the best defensive rating in the NBA, as his great two-way play would see him finish third in MVP voting. The Bullets started the year 7-0, and overall cruised through the regular season with a top 5 scoring offense and defense, en route to a 60-22 record, which tied Boston for the best record in the league. They would get a semi-finals matchup versus a Buffalo Braves team led by star big man Bob McAdoo, and while McAdoo was unstoppable this series, Hayes did his best to match him, as he would lead the Bullets in scoring while shooting over 50% from the field. After three games, the Bullets were up 2-1 and Hayes was averaging nearly 29 points while recording two double-doubles in those three games. McAdoo went off for 50, while Hayes had just 16 in Game 4, as the Braves evened it, but Hayes redeemed himself in Game 5, with a postseason career high of 46 points on over 73% shooting, while adding 12 rebounds and a win. Then after Buffalo forced a Game 7, Washington wrapped it up at home, setting up a conference finals matchup with Boston. Hayes would lead all scorers this series, and would record two double-doubles in the first three games. As Washington led 2-1, Boston would key in on Hayes for the remainder of the series, as he would only record one more double-double and shoot just 40%. But the Bullets would still take it in six, as they were heading to the NBA Finals to take on an underdog Warriors team. After defeating Boston, many people thought the season was all but decided and the Bullets would easily defeat the Warriors. But Rick Barry had other ideas, and it didn't help that Hayes had a down series by his standards. He came out strong with 29 and 16 in Game 1, but the Bullets lost. Then in Game 2, he managed 15 points on just 3 of 15 shooting, as Washington fell behind 0-2. He had a solid 24 and 9 in Game 3, but again the Bullets couldn't take care of business, as they were now in the dreaded 3-0 hole. Then even though Hayes scored efficiently in Game 4, he still had just 15 points, as the Bullets lost by 1 and lost out on a ring. As Hayes' season had seen him average about 23 points, 12 rebounds, and 2.5 and blocks per game. 1976 saw the Bullets trade for veteran point guard Dave Bing, while also getting a great season from the second year Truck Robinson, but the team was still led by Hayes, Unseld, and Chenier. The Bullets slowed down their pace this year, 
which led to a scoring decrease. Hayes was again a top 2 scorer on the team, but for the first time in his career, he averaged less than 20 points, but he would still hit double figures in 76 games and record 50 double doubles, en route to another all-star selection and a spot on the all-NBA second team, and he remained an impactful defender, finishing top 3 in both blocks and defensive rating, as he would again finish top 10 in MVP voting. And while it would have been hard for the Bullets to improve on last season's record, they took a bigger step back than expected, as they would win 12 less games to finish with just a 48-34 record. However, it was still a top 3 record in the East and would lead to a playoff matchup with Cleveland. Hayes had one of his lowest scoring playoff series of his career, but would still lead the team in scoring and rebounding, with his most valuable contribution being his rim protection, as he averaged over 3.5 blocks for the 7-game series. He started strong with 28-18 and 18 in a Game 1 win, but over his next three, he averaged less than 13 points on 31% shooting, as the series was tied 2-2. Cleveland went up 3-2, but Hayes helped the Bullets stave off elimination with 28 points, 13 rebounds, and 8 blocks in a Game 6 win. But even though he recorded a Game 7 double-double, Cleveland held on to win by 2 and advance, as Hayes' season had seen him average about 20 points, 11 rebounds, and 2.5 and blocks per game. The 1977 season would be one of the greatest of Hayes' career. He would return to being a top 10 scorer in the league, and did so on a career-high 50.1% shooting, while also leading his team in rebounds and finishing top 10 in the league in that category as well. And once again, he was one of the league's top shot blockers. He would hit double figures in 78 games, which included 4 games with at least 40, and he would record 64 double-doubles with his best game coming on March 13th, when he scored 47 points and pulled down 20 rebounds in a loss to Golden State, as he was named an All-Star and a member of the All-NBA First Team, and would again finish top 10 in MVP voting for the fifth consecutive season. The Bullets looked like the same team from last year, but had a new man at the head of the bench, in head coach Dick Mata, who had been hired as Casey Jones' replacement. The team took some time to adjust to Mata, as after 22 games they were 9-13 but they would go 39-21 the rest of the way to finish with a 48-34 record and make a return to the playoffs, where they would get a rematch with Cleveland. Hayes would fall to the team's second leading scorer this series, but would lead both teams by averaging 16 rebounds, as he would still record at least 20 points and 10 rebounds in each game, with Game 2 seeing him turn in a 21-point, 23-rebound performance, as the Bullets would take the series in three games, leading to a second-round matchup with Hayes' former team in the Houston Rockets. But Hayes had trouble finding his shot, as although he averaged nearly 21 points per game, he shot below 43%. However, he remained effective by leading the Bullets in rebounding and blocks, and his final three games of the series would see him up his play to average over 24 points and 11 rebounds. But those three games were all losses, as the Rockets would take it in six, with Hayes' regular season seeing him average about 23.5 points, 12.5 rebounds, and 2.5 and blocks per game. But 1978 would be the year that the Bullets finally broke through and lived up to their potential. Over the offseason, the Bullets acquired longtime Milwaukee Bucks star Bob Dandridge, which would end up being an even more valuable signing after Chenier was limited to just 36 games this season, as this injury would also lead to a breakout year from Kevin Grevy. Hayes would lead the team in scoring, as he and Dandridge would combine to average 39 points, and Hayes would also record his highest rebounding average in years as he would be a top 5 rebounder in the league, and combined with Unseld to average nearly 25 rebounds. Hayes would hit double figures in 74 games, and record 60 double-doubles, as well as his first officially recorded triple-double, in a March 3rd defeat of Detroit, when he finished with 22 points, 27 rebounds, and 11 blocks, as Hayes would find himself in yet another All-Star game. However, the Bullets weren't really turning heads. They had been playing well to begin the season, but were losing their momentum as the year went on and would finish out the season going 4-5 in their final 9, finish with just a 44-38 record, which would get them a first round matchup with Atlanta. This would be a 2 game sweep for Washington, as Hayes averaged a modest 14 points and 11.5 rebounds, while recording 5 total blocks for the series. Round 2 brought San Antonio, and Hayes took on a much more prominent role, leading the Bullets in scoring, rebounding, and blocks, while shooting over 55% from the field. He would have 26-15 with 11 offensive rebounds in a Game 1 loss, and would average 26 points, 12 rebounds, and nearly 4 blocks over the next 3. As the Bullets went up 3-1, Hayes would have just 17-13 in Game 5 as the Spurs extended the series. But then in Game 6 back home, Hayes dropped a game-high 25 points along with 15 rebounds and a win to advance to a Conference Finals matchup with Philly. 
Hayes didn't have the same lights out shooting performance in this series, but he still led Washington in scoring, rebounding, and blocks, as he would average over 3 blocks per game. He started with 28 points, 18 rebounds, and 6 blocks in a Game 1 win, and proceeded to record a double-double in each game of the series, with his best performance coming in Game 4, when he had 35 points and 19 rebounds, while shooting 63% from the field in a win, which put the Bullets up 3 games to 1. He had an inefficient 12 points in a Game 5 loss, but came back in Game 6 with 21 points, 14 rebounds, and 5 blocks, as the Bullets wrapped up the series and were heading to the Finals to take on Seattle. Hayes led all scorers in this series and finished second among all players in rebounding, while also leading the Bullets in blocks. His scoring dropped, but it was more so because the Bullets were getting points from everywhere, as they featured 6 players averaging double figures this series. Hayes wouldn't record his first double-double until Game 3, but it was a big one, with 29 points and 20 rebounds. Yet it came in a losing effort, as the Bullets found themselves down 2 games to 1, but they would win 2 of their next 3, as Hayes averaged over 19 points and 12 rebounds, while recording 2 more double-doubles during that stretch. Then even though he had just 12 points and 8 rebounds before fouling out of Game 7, the Bullets prevailed on the road to win their first championship in franchise history. And while there was a lot that you could say about Elvin Hayes after his decade in the league, one thing you could no longer say was that E was not a champion, and his regular season had seen him average about 19.5 points, 13.5 rebounds, and 2 blocks per game. Although they were aging, the Bullets were still a favorite to repeat in 1979. Hayes came back with yet another season leading the team in scoring, rebounding, and blocks, and would finish as a top 10 rebounder and shot blocker in the league. He would hit double figures in 78 games and record 59 double doubles, again being named an All-Star, as well as a first team All-NBA member, and would finish top 3 in MVP voting. And with an entire offseason to gel, the Bullets looked even stronger, and boasted an improved offense and defense. They would string together 9 straight wins early in the season, and never looked back en route to their best record in 5 years at 54-28, which would get them a first round bye, then a rematch with Atlanta in the semis. Hayes came out strong with 31-15 in a Game 1 win, then after a poor Game 2 showing, he would come back and record double doubles in each remaining game of the series. Games 3 and 4 saw him average 24 points and 15.5 and rebounds, as the Bullets won both to take a commanding 3-1 lead. But then even though he averaged 25 points and 12 and a half rebounds over the next two, Atlanta won both to force a Game 7. But Hayes put the Bullets on his back in Game 7 with 39 points and 15 rebounds to will the team to a win, setting up a conference finals matchup with San Antonio. This would be another tough 7 game series, with Hayes seeing a decline in his play over the first 4 games, as he was averaging about 19 points on less than 40% shooting, while also recording just 2 combined blocks as Washington went down 3-1, but then Hayes would score no less than 24 points while pulling down no less than 14 rebounds in each of the final 3 games of the series, while importantly averaging nearly 5 blocks, as Washington completed the comeback to win in 7, setting up a finals rematch with Seattle. But Seattle was even hungrier, and although Hayes still averaged about 20-12 and 12 in the series, he shot below 40%. Washington squeaked out a Game 1 win after a controversial foul call, but after that, Seattle locked in. Hayes recorded double-doubles in 3 of the next 4 games, which included a 29-point, 14-rebound performance in Game 5. But all 4 of those games would end in defeat, as Seattle would take the series and the title in 5 games, with Hayes' season seeing him average about 22 points, 12 rebounds, and 2.5 blocks per game. Dandridge started to break down during the 1980 season, but third-year forward Greg Ballard helped make up for the lost production. Hayes and Unseld continued as the team's leaders, and even at 34 years old, Hayes was showing no signs of slowing down. He would have yet another season as a top 10 scorer and rebounder in the league, while finishing top 5 in shot blocking. He would appear in 81 games and hit double figures in each game, including 2 games with at least 40, as a March 16th loss to New York would mark his final 40-point game of his career as he finished with 43 points on 68% shooting, along with 13 rebounds, which would be one of his 52 double-doubles on the year, once again being voted an All-Star, marking his 12th appearance in 12 seasons, yet it would also be his final appearance. The Bullets would also trade Chenier this season, as their offense took a big hit, so they were now one of the league's lowest scoring teams with an average defense, which led to their first losing record since Hayes' arrival at 39-43. But luckily, this would be enough for a first round matchup with Philly. Hayes would average 20 and 11 for the series, but shot just 39% from the field, and a younger Sixers team would be too much. 
as they wrapped up the series in two games, with Hayes' season ending with him averaging about 23 points, 11 rebounds, and 2.5 blocks per game. After the season, Mata resigned, and his replacement was a familiar face for Hayes, as they brought back Gene Shu, who had been Hayes' coach nearly a decade earlier when the Bullets were in Baltimore. Hayes continued as the team's leading scorer and shot blocker while finishing second in rebounding, but he was putting up career low numbers, but still hitting double figures in 69 games and recording 40 double doubles. But with Unseld missing 19 games and Dandridge managing just 23 games, that era of Bullets basketball was clearly nearing its end. And although the Bullets under Shu boasted one of the league's best defenses, they were still one of its lowest scoring teams, finishing with another 39 and 43 record. Yet this season, it wouldn't be enough for a playoff berth, as Hayes' year had seen him average about 18 points, 9.5 rebounds, and 2 blocks per game. But after nearly a decade with the team, Hayes would have a new home in 1982. Yet, it wasn't unfamiliar. Hayes would make a return to the Rockets, as he was traded for a couple draft picks, with the main reason for the Bullets making the move being that they wanted to free up cap space in hopes of making a significant contract offer to forward Mitch Kupchak. But making the deal with Houston was their way of thanking Hayes, as he had always expressed a desire to return home and end his career in Houston. And although he was set to turn 36 soon, the Rockets were still happy to get one of the greatest players in league history to join Moses Malone and Robert Reed in the front court. Hayes would have a respectable season in his return to Houston, playing and starting in all 82 games, and even as the oldest player in the league, he was still playing 37 minutes a night, and was second to Malone in scoring, rebounding, and blocks. And while Malone clearly was the star, on January 10th, 1982, all eyes were on Hayes, as late in the first quarter of a game against Portland, he would score his 25,000th career point, becoming the sixth player in NBA history to accomplish the feat. And while the slow-paced Rockets didn't feature a high-scoring offense, they did feature one of the league's better defenses, and were able to finish with a 46-36 record, which got them a first-round matchup with Seattle. Hayes would average 14-10 for the series, but would shoot just 34% from the field. But he was effective on the defensive end, as he averaged over 3 blocks per game. However, the Rockets would fall in 3 games, as Hayes returned to Houston had seen him average about 16 points, 9 rebounds, and 1.5 and blocks per game. But this would end up being his final playoff appearance, as well as his final season as a full-time starter. The Rockets had lost their best player over the offseason, so now their best offensive player was the 15-year veteran Hayes. But after spending the first half of the season as a starter, he would be moved to the bench for the second half, as the Rockets were one of the league's worst teams and needed to think towards the future. So it made more sense to give younger players more playing time. Plus, having Hayes come off the bench gave them some guaranteed offense on their second unit. But regardless, Hayes missed just one game all season and finished as a top three scorer, rebounder, and shot blocker on the team. However, the Rockets finished with a league worst 14 and 68 record, as Hayes's year had seen him average about 13 points, seven and a half rebounds, and a block per game. The Rockets would get the first pick in the 83 draft and would bring in highly touted big man Ralph Sampson which was the biggest news of the offseason. But other big news was Hayes announcing that 1984 would be the final season of his legendary career. And a man who once had a reputation as a selfish player who could easily get down on his teammates was now expressing excitement to tutor the young Samson. So the 84 season would see Hayes get a minimal role on the team as he would still appear in 81 games but would only get about 12 minutes a night and put up career low numbers as the Rockets finished with a 29-53 and record and missed the playoffs with Hayes' farewell season ending, with him averaging about 5 points, 3 rebounds, and half a block per game. So while it wasn't the most memorable farewell season, Hayes walked away from the game in good spirits, and was most satisfied with his role in helping the development of Samson. But he also walked away from the game third all-time in both scoring and rebounding, as well as third in blocks, since they became an officially recorded stat. But perhaps most impressive was that he missed just 9 games over 16 years in the league and retired having played more games and more minutes than any other player in history, and was the first player to reach 50,000 career minutes. After basketball, Hayes would finish his degree, then briefly try his hand in coaching, and later end up as a radio announcer for his alma mater. But what likely meant the most was his induction into the Basketball Hall of Fame in 1990. By no means is Elvin Hayes a completely forgotten player, but just how good he was doesn't seem to be talked about anymore. His turnaround was automatic, but he could give you points any way he wanted. You may look at his efficiency and wish for better, but he was often smaller than his matchup and had no problem attacking big men down low. And while this may have led to misses, 
he was also an elite rebounder who might have two or three putback attempts on one possession before getting the shot to fall, so the efficiency is a little deceptive. And while Hayes is also remembered most fondly for his scoring, he doesn't seem to get his credit as one of the NBA's greatest rebounders and shot blockers. While standing at just six foot nine, he was basically just better than everyone else and knew it. But as a confident and prideful young player, he got so used to hero ball that he didn't want to stray from it, leading to him developing a poor reputation during his first few years in the league. But when he became a bullet, he not only learned, but he accepted the team game and paired with Wes Unsell to create one of the league's fiercest front courts throughout the 70s. And by the time he returned to Houston in his twilight years, he was a changed man. So yes, his accolades are endless, he remains near the top of many leaderboards, and he was a first ballot Hall of Famer. But that doesn't mean that he still can't be overlooked. And as newer generations come along, the legend of Elvin Hayes will become just that, a legend. But for the generations who saw him play, they'll tell you that Elvin Hayes was as real as it got. But that's it for today's episode on the Big E. Hope you enjoyed it, and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on another high-scoring big man from the 70s. Or this one, on the player he mentored during his farewell season. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.